You know, Ravnica. I mean, probably. You did click on this video. But uh, even if you don't, stick around and you soon will. It's a great big fantasy city and a very popular Magic the Gathering. And now, Dungeons and Dragons setting. And you also know those guilds who control the city. Again, stick around. The face of Ravnica, those 10 different groups, all locked in perpetual balance and struggle, each with their own flavor of magic. Maybe a personality test told you which one you are. Which one did you get? Oh, me too. Ravnica's great, right? Whether you're looking at it to play cards or bark at your friends from behind a cardboard screen, it's just a bloody good setting. And whilst it's got its own ocean of lore accumulated across its various card sets and books, you really only need the two words to understand it. City, guilds. It's a big city where ten different guilds all vie for power. And if you already know about the city and the guilds, then... What else is there to know? I mean, it's called Ravnica City of Guilds. Surely there's nothing else to care about on the subject. Let me go back to sleep. It's a big city full of guilds and that's that. But what if I told you that the thing that I just said wasn't true? And in fact, I only said it to emphasize what I'm about to say. That despite how much the guilds dominate the city and the minds of anyone thinking about Ravnica, not everybody living in the big fantasy city actually belongs to a guild. Anytime they are mentioned though, the guildless of Ravnica tend to receive responses ranging from, oh, I guess they must exist. All the way up to a resounding, oh yeah, they exist. But despite this, and despite their lack of spotlight, it turns out the majority of Ravnica's population is guildless. Or maybe just less than half. There's conflicting information about, but regardless, a huge chunk of Ravnica's people don't belong to any guild. And this little lore factoid drums up a lot of questions for me. Like, why are so many people guildless? Why wouldn't someone want to join one of the ten fabulous guilds? Or why can't they? What does it even mean to be guildless in the city of guilds? The ungilded have been here since Ravnica's very beginning, and they've been forgotten about for just as long. I want to hoist the guildless out from the city's darkened alleyways and into that spotlight they've been missing, so we can all have a good gore pam. Ravnica's had three whole blocks of cards at this point, across several years, and each of those had its own collection of accompanying novels and short stories. And on top of that, when they're polled, it's usually Magic Player's favourite setting. Which is why I'm hoping I don't regret this isn't a video about Strixhaven. Or insert... It's probably way too late to use Strixhaven. During this series, I want to examine the Guildless in each era of Ravnica. To find out just who on earth they are, how they've evolved over the years, and what their existence says about Ravnica and its gilded masters. So, are you feeling unburdened by useless knowledge of a fictional place? That's great! You're the perfect candidate to validate all this time I've went- I mean, hear all these things I've learned. Come with me by remaining perfectly still on a journey to the very foundations of the city to uncover a tale of the forgotten and downtrodden that will see Ravnica's darkest secrets laid bare. Starting at the beginning would probably make a good beginning. So let's go back then. Back to when little Ravnica was just a glint in her dad's logo. And we can learn how this guild-run city was conceived. Let's take a look at the birth of the original Ravnica block. Back when the world was a sprightly 2005. Perhaps it will help us to understand the guildless. It will, I promise. I'm Silvermere, or James, and welcome to the first part of the series. Get ready to hear the word guild so many times that it loses all meaning. From its very beginning, Wizards of the Coast wanted Ravnica to be about multicolour. Now, if you don't know, although you probably do, magic cards are split up into five colours that all act differently, both mechanically and flavourfully. I've seen a lot of new players mistake the differences in the five colours as elemental, when really what makes them unique, and the game so good, is the five colours differing philosophies. Each of these ideologies and their interactions with each other is governed by the colour pie, or colour wheel which becomes a guideline for card design, so that the differently coloured cards all act differently and consistently. Colours next to each other on the wheel get along better than colours across from each other, and when it's implemented properly, the colour pie keeps the game... good. Watch the Mana Sources series on colour philosophy for a much deeper dive on this. They're excellent videos. I don't know if I'm supposed to provide... I don't know if I should provide links or not. You... You know how to type. So when they were developing Ravnica Block... By the way, a block of cards is made up of three connected sets of cards released a few months apart from each other. 
It was the structure wizards used for most of their sets back in the day, although they don't use that model anymore. So, when they were developing Ravnica block, Wizards of the Coast wanted it to stand out from their previous multicolor set, Invasion, where that block had offered players ways to use as many colors as possible in their decks. Ravnica would get people playing with two color combinations, and treat each of those color combinations with the same importance. This caused its own set of problems for the design team, but it was an idea from the creative team, one Brady Domovoff to be specific, that would begin to solve these problems, whilst giving the block its most unique feature. He proposed that they give each of the ten two-color combinations its own identity and flavour, just like the five individual colours had. What if, Brady said, the colour wheel for this block governed ten colours instead of five? He called his idea the Guild Model. The guilds of Ravnica were a triumph of mechanical and creative design. Each one an organisation of different people and ideas designed to represent their two combined colours philosophy. Ravnica Block won game design awards I didn't know existed until I wrote this segment. It was a massive hit with the Magic community, tons of people came back to the game after a previous block had messed it up for a while. Players loved the two colour theme, and its new mechanics and interactions, and they loved the flavour the guilds brought to them. Ravnica Block was as close to a perfect marriage as you can get out of Magic, where the game and story design feel united. Fill your deck with two colours and take on the mantle of their guild. Whichever guild best represents you or your draft pulls. The guild model was such a success that many Magic the Gathering players still use the different guild names today as shorthand for their respective colour combinations, even outside the context of Ravnica. But not every card in Ravnica was guild themed. There needed to be other cards there to provide some mechanical space and diversity to the player's options. And if they weren't evoking the guilds, then the unguilded cards needed to be evoking Ravnica's other big idea. After the guild model was established, the decision to set the block in a city was apparently a pretty natural one. The ten guilds would be the driving forces and rulers of this world. They needed a fresh backdrop for their new personalities and interactions, and a giant Prague-inspired fantasy metropolis could effectively serve their functions whilst looking pretty neat. And a city that was big enough, that was so sprawling and vast that it could somehow squeeze in each of all these ten different distinctive groups, didn't leave room for much else. How truly vast this city must be, that I have travelled so far and seen so much, yet never once found the place where the buildings fail. Ravnica Cityscape covers the entire surface of its world. It's Fantasy Coruscant! So of course, Wizards of the Coast wanted to make sure that anyone playing Ravnica would feel the city setting. In the words of Matt Kavota, the block's creative lead, the creative team made a point of injecting city world flavour into every facet of magic that it affects. Art, packaging, card concepts, card names, and flavour text. Conveying the feel of a compact urban environment was very important to us. Ravnica's forests and mountains and plains don't show forests and mountains and plains because there aren't any forests and mountains or plains. It's all city. Everywhere. All of it. Or basically, probably. It's mostly sold like that, but wizards do like to be vague about the potential for some areas of exposed surface. Which is probably a good thing. It's better when they're not specific with stuff like magic. They, they ruined ghosts on Instrad for that. I don't want to know why there's ghosts. That just ruins the idea of ghosts, right? They're not scary if you know exactly what it is. Um. And whilst the city fills out the background of many a gilded card, the focus with any of them is to tout their respective guild, first and foremost. For the gilded cards, city flavour is secondary. Without a guild of their own to tout, Ravnica's guildless cards became little unobscured windows into its city life. What they've got on offer are its citizens. Civic Wayfinder can save you from the dark of the alley and take you somewhere safer. A basic land, perhaps? Although the darkness covering his eyes and the glint along his hoisted blade might give us some hesitation. Maybe you'd rather hire some goblin spelunkers. Chimney sweeps? Explorers of abandoned buildings? Spire climbers? Goblin spelunkers have found countless niches within Ravnica's metropolis. A mainstay of Magic the Gathering, goblins are almost always red creatures and heavily associated with mountains. Here, the goblins are applying their typical trade, but in Ravnica's various new interpretations of their typical home. There are solitary sphinxes and snapping drakes, spreading their wings against the spired skies. Giant guards patrolling the streets, elves climbing towers instead of trees, mages doing something suspect in an alleyway. Instead of a neck-replicating thrash thing, we have a little tiny teeny Audrey II-style hydra in a plant pot. Yeah. Wait, what happens in Little Shop of Horrors again? The guildless cards weren't the focus of Ravnica, but like its basic lands, they were an opportunity to sell its setting to its players. But as they weren't the focus, guildless cards were usually designed as being what the gilded cards weren't. Namely, monocolored. Now, there were certainly many single-colored guild cards, but they were generally designed around having synergy with their guild's mechanics and respective other color. Guildless cards tended to have a broader design 
and fall outside of the guild's mechanics, complementing or countering them where needed, here to fill the gaps between the guilds. But aside from filling a few of those monocolored gaps in people's decks, the guildless of Ravnica are mostly a footnote next to the shiny shiny guilds. Again, city of guilds. Outside of their successful game design, and just flavor-wise, the guild's actions dominate the majority of the cards, and the accompanying novel series, and the promotional material, and they're the plane's ruling and governing bodies, and they own and control its various vast districts. <laughs> but, like I said earlier, most of all the fantasy people living in Ravnica's endless urban sprawl don't belong to any guild, and the majority of the population is guildless. Although, despite their size, they collectively hold little to no power on the plane, and most live in relative poverty. Their role filling gaps in players' decks might tip us off to the function of guildless citizens in Ravnican society. Most Ravnicans lead lives of desperate survival. Those who thrive are malleable enough to change with the ever-shifting politics of the guilds. This mightn't be quite as terrible as it sounds for Ravnica's ungilded proletariat, but regardless of their power, the guilds don't exactly place the best interests of the people or the plane high on their list of priorities. The first Ravnica block has a trilogy of associated novels, one for each set, and their author, Corey Herndon, credits the creative team with most of the details of Ravnica's setting, but also says he was given a lot of creative control over the story he wrote for them. Now, lore-wise, each guild is bound by the Guild Pact, a magical contract signed by the founders of each of the ten guilds 10,000 years prior to the original set to establish peace on the plane after a mythic period of war. At the time of the original set, the Guild Pact still kept the guilds from engaging in open conflict, uh, magically, as well as defining each of their roles within society. Each is supposedly bound by the pact to perform various different civic functions to help the city plane keep ticking over. Policing and medicine and agriculture, etc. By the time of the modern era, the Guild Pact has existed in multiple different forms since the original. Some versions magically enforced and some not. But even then, the guilds are still tied to their civic responsibilities, and the pact is always at the centre of Ravnica's political structure, regardless of the set. Although, as we will soon see, the way they choose to perform these duties can be pretty to very questionable. From the mouth of a wizard himself, most guilds, in their own way, work to undermine the others in order to become the sole power on Ravnica. The common citizen, most of whom are not guild members, are usually ignored by the guilds, if not treated with outright contempt. They make up the majority of casualties in this struggle, but no one outside the guilds has the power to make a difference. At least, not yet. That mysterious not yet sounds like it could be pretty promising for the common folk, but I guess we'll have to see. Whilst the Guild Pact supposedly maintains some peace and stability, many of the guilds don't exactly celebrate its restrictions. Rather than viewing it as a unifying bond or taking some identity from the responsibilities it bestows, often the guilds just think of it as a leash. But clearly the magic of the original pact was immensely powerful, preventing conflict and forcing collaboration between violently opposed groups to the point where their civilizations spread across the globe, unchallenged. Once, Ravnica was like any other plane, but over 10,000 years of pact-enforced peace, its civilizations crept out from the various cities until they reached each other's doorsteps. Now, these dotted cities are still Ravnica's major population centers, but the space between them is all covered in buildings too. So while the whole world is city, it's made up of various connected cities. Ravnica's central city, confusingly called Ravnica, is divided up into 10 districts, and the majority of the story, and important stuff, is located in District 10. So while Ravnica's a big, big place, most of the time we're talking about here. Although I'd say you can reasonably assume a lot of it applies out in the rest of the plane too. All of the guilds have power and influence in all of the central city's 10 districts, and across the rest of the plane, and the guild pack's influence spreads just as far. So, back at the time of the first Ravnica block, under the magic of the original guild pact, vaguely but powerfully maintaining order, and preventing at least larger-scale conflicts. A tense and uneasy peace between guilds is the status quo we're met with in the original Ravnica set. But that peace is pretty bloody uneasy, and tensions between guilds play out as a kind of cold war, taking its toll on the city as the guilds' ambitions crash against each other. With one particularly large, and potentially even larger, group caught systematically in the crossfire. And this is actually, unfortunately, the best way to grasp who the guildless are in the original Ravnica block, through the actions of the guilds and their effect on their ungilded citizens. If we want to know the guildless people of Ravnica, we're going to have to find out how the guilds treat them. So hold on to those straps while the pace stays the same, because we're going to run through each of all the ten two-color guilds. Who they are, who they're supposed to be, 
and how each one's actions affect Ravnica's massive guildless population. This is going to take a while. Hope you've got a while. Minor disclaimer. I'm not sure if disclaimer's... Disclaimer's not really the right word here. It's more like deflections of potential criticism. We'll say disclaimer. Look, I know you know who the guilds are, but shut up. I'm trying to do a series on Ravnica. I've got groundwork to do. And anyway, you can find out how they treat the guildless and then tell me what I got wrong in the comments. I can't wait. For clarification, I'm going to be talking about the guilds as they were in the original blog, but almost all of what I'm saying applies to their modern equivalents. All of the guilds have undergone transformations over the years, but they're primarily aesthetic, and where my descriptions differ from their most recent showings, I'll let you know. Cool? Good. Also, I'm sorry about the low resolution of much of the art. 2005 was a different time, and most of the ones that I couldn't find are pulled from Scryfall. Thank you so much, Scryfall. You're a godsend. I wanted to use only art from the original block to paint you an accurate picture of the time, and I mostly kept to that rule, but I failed, I think, at least about twice per chapter, so sorry about that. It's like 90% original block art. Is that good enough? It'll have to be. It's done now. Anyway, enough. Me. Get on with the thing. The blue and white Azorius Senate write the laws on Ravnica and act as its government. The blue manner of their pairing fuels their white manner desire for order with its own drive for perfection, landing ultimately at a detached, holier-than-thou, bureaucratic approach to everything. Whilst the positions in their hierarchy and the legislature they write are voted on, that privilege is reserved for members of the guild. They don't necessarily rule Ravnica outright, as they rely heavily on the guild pact and their alliance with the other white-affiliated guilds in order to maintain order in order to maintain order. But that said, the guild's founder, the powerful but absent ex-Planeswalker Azor, authored the guild pact himself all those millennia ago, so it's not surprising that they might benefit from some favoritism. Particularly in the original block, but still today, the Azorius are characterized as detached from the realities of the city and obsessed with bureaucracy and formality. Their modern logo has been edited to be less on the nose, but in the original block, the rigid triangle of the Azorius Senate symbol was segmented by a spherical maze, signifying their resistance to change and their intent to delay progress. I mean, here's the flavor text for their first guild hall. Prav where much work is done to make sure nothing is accomplished. Believing themselves to be the arbiters of a fragile order, the laws of the Azorius pen protect the status quo rather than their citizens. Most of whom, gilded or otherwise, don't think too highly of the Senate. And if the laws are protecting the status quo, then the people not protected by the status quo are the guildless. Outside of the confusing and megalomaniacal plot of their guild leader in the original novels, and various other attempts at greater totalitarianism in the later blocks, the Senate's laws are mostly concerned with maintaining the order of the guild pact, keeping the guilds in line and upholding the balance of power. Both the laws the Senate writes and the magical guild pact offer the ten guilds status in their structured society, as well as some protection from each other. But it's each other the Azorius are concerned with, and no status or protection, magical or otherwise, is offered to the guildless. A huge legal and magically enforced divide is drawn between those who belong to a guild and those who don't, provided they aren't directly messing with the guilds. For the most part, the guildless are beneath legal consideration, essentially making them second-class citizens and leaving them free to be preyed upon by the other guilds. The myriad rainbow of human rights abuses that we'll come to learn about as we run down this list are all essentially legal on Ravnica. Want to do a crime? Do it to a guildless. Murder in the central city is legal under a ton of conditions. Many of the guilds trade in assassination, and provided the right paperwork accompanies the murder, it's not a murder. Hi officer, here's the murder weapon and my official not a murder form. But if the murderee is guildless? No paperwork required. Not even a murder. No worries. Uh, do you mind officer? I'm trying to eat the rest of this corpse. Provided you're not disturbing the peace, Crimes are only investigated by the cops, up to the extent that it can be determined whether or not the crime concerns guild business. Fortunately, for the preservation of the possible crime scene, Zusa was well established with the Orzhov Guild, making this potential murder a punishable violation of commerce laws. Not long ago, Peter said, this wouldn't even be worth our time. You know that, right? A simple murder like this, I mean, we might really be stretching the definition of guild commerce here. There was no sigil over the door. There's this moment in the second novel where this researcher accidentally admits in court that the contagion his team was working on killed 677 guildless people, and it's this gotcha moment for the prosecutor. But not because the researcher killed all those people, as they were guildless and therefore did not need to be officially recorded, but because he had failed to hand over the corpses and ghosts of his unrecorded guildless victims, as per his contract with the Orshov Guild, who'd funded the contagion. Macabre corporate justice prevails. In many ways, although I could say this for a good number of the guilds, 
The Azorius are the worst of the ten for the old Ravnican guildless, as their laws literally condemn them to second-class citizen status and below. The abundance of slums, and the thugs and other beasties hiding in alleyways, show us that the Azorius's entirely detached approach to governing the guildless doesn't exactly create a very privileged underclass. And I'm sure they've got some bit of legislation limiting the amount of guildless citizens each guild can legally turn into mulch each year, but I haven't seen it. The cold war among guilds that churns out ungilded corpses has essentially been systemified by the Senate in their maintaining of a volatile status quo that includes demon cultists and mad scientists and a bunch of ghosts. But when the majority of the casualties of the constant tension are hardly considered people, they're hardly considered casualties either. Many of the other guilds are far more predatory, but the Azorius fail the guildless profoundly through their inaction, especially as they're the group with the most power to change their situation. But they don't. The status quo they protect so diligently holds more stake to the Azorius than all the guildless lives who it hurts so regularly. Turning a blind eye to countless creative injustices whilst labelling them the system at work from their literal ivory towers. Remember when I used the word predatory a moment ago? The Orzhov Syndicate is the white-black guild of business and commerce. On Ravnica, there's no financial dealing or trade that the Orzhov do not know about, if not outright manipulate. Through their numerous cartels across the plain, the Orzhov keep Ravnica's money flowing, whilst keeping the largest portion for themselves. Originally founded as a religion, by the time of the old block, the guild has no true faith left. Greed, wealth, and the structure that breeds it being the only things they truly worship. Despite this, they still present themselves as a religious institution, reaping and exploiting all the benefits their position offers, preying on the desperation of the population, with false promises of fortune and protection, in exchange for their devotion and what little wealth of any regard that they have. The Orzhov believe that instilling their many followers with guilt will further their dependency on the guild, and that this guilt is crucial for the smooth paying of debts and the continuation of their exploitative structure. Orzhov faithful file past to have their minds purged of impure desires. There, the guilt wardens eliminate any thoughts of hope or self-sufficiency. Death on Ravnica, especially at this time, is not an exact science, and the dying are prone to various forms of reanimation body and soul, something the Syndicate is very interested in. In the original block, and until recently, the guild was run by the Obsidat, the Ghost Council of Orzhova, comprised of the spirits of previous guild leaders, all playing out their reigns indefinitely through undeath. But the Orzhov's extortion of the cycle of life goes further. If there's one thing the Orzhov demand from their followers above guilt and devotion, it's that they pay. And if you have any kind of dealings with the Orzhov, which is most of all dealings on Ravnica, apparently, then you probably have debts too. Many of their most indebted debtors are guildless or lesser guild members, with no hope of ever paying off what they owe. Whilst they're still alive. If the Church of Deals can't take their payment from your house and everything you own, and the servitude of you and your cat and your extended family, then put away your retirement plans, Billy, because you're going to summer school in the afterlife. That was a really, that was a very mixed metaphor. The guild binds the spirits of their debtors into undying subjugation, and until recently, boasted a vast host of sad slave ghosts. One moment conscious only of a sense of repose. The next moment, hearing the trudge of his own footsteps. He sighed and squinted into the glare ahead. You can feel the exhaustion here, as this poor soul is dragged back from eternal rest and into Orzhov syndicate servitude. And if you wanted a body for the funeral of your dad who's a ghost now, well, the Syndicate have a claim on that too. Now, when you're visiting your sad, spectral old dad in Orzhova, you can also meet his earthly remains, sculpted into part of a fleshy thrall that the guild uses to perform menial and generally degrading tasks. Oh, it's like we're a family again. I said that more predatory guilds took advantage of the Azorius's indifference to the guildless, and no guild is more flagrantly, unashamedly willing to wear that exploitative crown than the Orzhov. The guild's unnatural convergence of its two opposed colours philosophies sees White's need for order and community used as a facade to hurt the population, whilst Black funnels wealth to the top. Like some kind of evil money scam triangle. Regardless of how they present themselves to Ravnica's population, the Church of Deals lives up to its name. The Orzhov drip with the excess of all the wealth they've gleamed off the general populace. Operating somewhere between one of those messed up American money churches who think Jesus was into private jets or whatever. Whatever you do right now, don't you stop tithing and a mafia that's become irremovably entrenched in the city's economy. A lot of the guilds may fail the guildless through their inaction, or at the cost of their ambitions, 
But the Orzhov's open subjugation of the people is at the core of their operation. It's their in whole entire deal. Extortion is an Orzhov guarantee, and it's all part of the city's day to day. What I've described so far, of all their various abuses, is just their bread and butter. The ghosts and the debt? That's just like happening in the background while they read newspapers. They do a lot more evil stuff. The things they get up to. But there's bits running long and we know the Orzhov sucks, so let's move on. Huh. It's just blank. But I swear I wrote a segment here. Hmm. The Red Blue Guild of mad sciencey types, the Is It League, is not actually the topic of this segment because I'm doing a joke! Because it's the Demir we're talking about, and the Demir is sneaky. Just like jokes. <laughs> we're talking about the Demir. Yeah. House Demir does not exist. Or at least that's what they'd love the city to think. In more recent blocks, the Demir have a public face, but in the original set, despite their founder, the vampire Z Zardek, Z oh god, how do you pronounce that? Zardek, or Zadek, I don't know, still being alive, only a few people on the plane know that the guild still exists, most believing it a myth or a piece of history. In a space where there is no room, in a structure that was never built, meets the guild that doesn't exist. The Blue Black Guild operate out of the Undercity, the vast network of sewers, tunnels, and sunken sections of Old City that lie under the pavement all across Ravnica. Supposedly, the Demir are Ravnica's couriers and librarians, and maybe they do that a bit off screen. But really, they're a bunch of spy guys. And to be honest, it's unclear what the guild's original purpose in the Guild Pact actually was, other than, like, being against it. It's confusing. Their vampire leaders got this convoluted plot in the novels to take over Ravnica using rules lawyering and the Y2K bug. He, like, gets arrested for trying to destroy the Guild Pact, but then that ends up dissolving the Guild Pact because the Demir are outlined by the Guild Pact as being against the Guild Pact. I'm confused, but regardless, spending most of their time trying really, really hard to pretend they don't exist means they aren't exactly performing many civic duties. There's no operatives out covertly fixing lampposts or whatever. Although it's definitely worth being wary down the public library. What they do love getting their hands on is information. Colour-wise, Black and Blue both love to acquire knowledge, either for its own sake or to obtain more power, and to the Demir, Knowledge and power are one and the same. They like to know just what everyone in Ravnica is doing, thank you very much. Often so they can tweak it where it suits them. The Demir just love doing underhanded espionage type stuff. Spying, smuggling, assassination, theft. In the more recent sets, these services are available to a more public market, who may not actually know they're dealing with the Demir. But in Olden Block, they mostly tended to do their own thing, furthering that confusing plot I mentioned with their spies and assassins and guys flying around on drakes. Is that a good idea? If you're supposed to be pretending you don't exist? It's probably a good thing that the Demir didn't want anyone to know about them in Ravnica City of Guilds because they kind of had an image problem back then. Imagine an assassin that not only doesn't want you to know that he's an assassin, but also doesn't want you to know that the organization he works for, a shadowy group with an undead leader, even exists. How do you suppose that person would dress? Demir guy, would you step forward? I mean, it's a little on the nose. You look like you're hiding something. Let's try it without the robes. <laughs> oh god. Oh, it's okay. I don't even have a funny analogy. You look like an assassin that really wants us to know that he works for a shadowy organization with an undead leader. Get out of here, Demir guy. We've got more examples to show. Bones and spikes and lies and knives are what little house operatives are made of. I guess the logic is if you never see them, they can wear whatever their bony hearts desire. This problem is mostly addressed in recent sets. And to their credit, even in the old block, they didn't tend to plaster their signet everywhere like the other guilds. But back in the day, even in a city with this guy, they did look kind of silly. You may be wondering why I haven't mentioned the poor guildless yet and how the unseen house screws them over, but like a lot of what the Demir do, it's tough to pin down. There isn't too much information on their interactions with the general populace in the old block, though they do tend to tip a lot of scales. In Oteve's mind, he ruled in favour of the accused, but in his courtroom, he was only a spectator, watching his hand deliver the sign of death. See what I mean? Justice is the ficklest of ideas on Ravnica, and with the Demir pulling stuff like that, then surely the Guildless are affected by the outcome of their actions. Just, you know, non-specifically. 
indirectly. We've got one minor offender here, though. Other guilds demand tolls from those who travel their territories, but not House Demir. It takes its share secretly, one coin purse at a time. Oh, and you almost scraped by, eh, the Demir? But you just had to pick a pocket or two. Tut and for shame, the Demir. I do think Demir Cut Purse suffers from their image problem a little bit. Wouldn't he be better off with a few more rags or a lot less? He looks cool though. Thanks, Kev. For the most part, in the original block, the Demir are too concerned with their plan to blow up the Guild Pact to bother with subjugating the Ungilded. It's pretty easy to imagine many guildless lives being affected by the outcome of their plane-spanning machinations, but we don't have any proof. Just the way they like it. Thinking about it, seeing as the Demir are the officially branded enemies of the Guild Pact, not that one, and the Guildless aren't protected by the Guild Pact, then the Demir's plans to kill it might offer the Guildless a better deal than they're already getting, as the guilds are brought down to their level. Are House Demir the secret champions of the Guildless? I... um... no. The House's plans might erase the magical distinction between the Gilded and the Not, but just like the other guilds, their goal is more power, and the road there isn't exactly paved with civic deeds. Don't trust the librarians. Plus, the Guild Pact's destruction leads to more open conflict on the plane, and you know what conflict between guilds on Ravnica means. It's dead people. Dead guildless people. It's dead people. <laughs> Whilst House Demir are no one's idea of a people's champion, they're far from the worst guild to the poor old guildless. Aside from a few picked pockets, clearly just recovering library late fees, the ungilded fall mostly beneath the Demir's concern, which is probably a good thing, and it's tough to point to how their broader actions specifically affect the ungilded, but doubtless they do. And probably not for the better. Still, could be worse. Remember what the Orshov were doing? I mean, Orshov prisoners are steeped in a blackened brew that robs their souls of strength. Patriarchs drink that brew to extend their own lives. I have a feeling there's more where that came from. The Red-Blue Guild of Mad Sciencey Types, the Is It League, is actually the topic of this section because I was doing a joke before, because that was about the Demir and the Demir are sneaky. Like, jokes. We're talking about the Is It now, though. The Is It League are as blue as they are red, meaning they're as obsessed with magical and technological progression and the acquisition of knowledge as they are unable to focus on one idea for more than half a minute. Maybe you can have fun comparing them to your favorite malignable younger generation. I'm underselling them. They're actually, potentially, the most dedicated group of engineers and researchers on Ravnica. Being the guild with the greatest understanding of magic on the plane and boasting the most accomplishments from its harnessing. That dedication might just jump from one idea to the next a bit prematurely. Which means a lot of Izzet projects are passed around the league a lot before they're done, and you know they say that too many wizards spoil the spell. Yeah, a lot of Izzet endeavors end up like this, whether intentionally or not. They invent useful but volatile stuff with useful but volatile magic is the bottom line. Arguably the most iconic guild, their guild leader and surviving founder, the egomaniacal genius dragon Niv Mizzet is more arguably the most iconic guild leader. Even more than the demon whose guild is just named after him. Niv makes up for not quite naming his guild after him though by plastering his name and face all over the guild. The Izzet signet is redesigned often, each time becoming closer to a vanity portrait of Niv Mizzet. True. But where the guildmaster imparts his image on the guild, he also imparts his lust for knowledge and progression. The Izzet are what Niv Mizzet is. Volatile, but useful. And they actually are responsible for much of the city's crucial infrastructure, having designed the sewers and foundries. Ravnica even has plumbing because of them, which is pretty advanced compared to most planes in Magic's multiverse. All right, Kaladesh, you win. The Izzet are supposedly also charged with maintaining these things, but you could probably guess how much they're into maintenance. Yeah, nah, their impulsiveness has them ever seeking the next crazy big thing and rarely looking back at the debris behind them. And this is where the Izzet start to become a problem for the Ungilded. Natural disasters in Ravnica are largely nullified by the Izzet. Unnatural disasters, on the other hand, happen all the time. The city is kind of at a point where it has benefited hugely from the Izzet's magic technological progression. By all rights, they've brought the city a ton of advancements and conveniences and explosions and searing steam and lightning-based accidents. But what Ravnica could really use right now, either in the old block or nowadays, is the League's focus applied to the areas that most need it, that aren't particularly exciting, but could hugely benefit from a little more mismization. Though where boredom lies, good luck finding an it. Who wants to fix someone's plumbing when you could be making a wingsuit out of fire? See, you get it. We all know we should 
be taking a look at the incredibly dangerous conditions for workers in our foundries, but we want to fly around with our mates in the sky and shoot magic. And there's only so many hours in the day. Those foundries that stand in for the Plains Mountains are towering structures, spilling burning smog from windows and chimneys and archways. If they look this safe to you from the outside, you should see the inside. Few have seen the inner workings of Ravnica's furnaces, but neighbouring districts catch brief glimpses in the horrors that escape the flames. If the angry fire elementals in the workplace can tell you anything, it's that safety is not high on the agenda. Nothing stops industry in Ravnica. Certainly not the safety of its workers. I kind of wish the art to Cold Hall of Swine drove the same point its awesome flavour text does. He's kind of just Hakuna matata around. I guess it's pretty dangerous to work next to a big dancing pig with an overstuffed coal carrier, though. It seems guildless workers that provide labour to the plane could be in for any number of a vast selection of crazy deaths just down to the insane conditions they have to work in. But the Izzet are under no incentive to address any of these problems. No one's making them, and they're not making themselves. The Guild Pact and the laws of the Senate don't exactly offer the Guildless many workplace protections whilst they let them get murdered for free. Outside of whatever the minimum acceptable amount is. The flavour text for the City of Guild's printing of Smash says it perfectly. Ravnica's laws protect not its citizens, but its industry. The Izzet League, under the direction of Niv-Mizzet, have brought about huge industrial and technological improvements to the city that have no doubt benefited the lives of its citizens, even all the way at the bottom of the ladder. But at that last rung where the guildless hang, those improvements are felt the least and their cost is felt the greatest. The unfocused volatility that accompanies everything the Izzet do, coupled with the fact that the only restrictions that are placed on them don't even apply to the ungilded, meaning that, once again, the guildless are paying the cost of a guild's actions, whether through blood or labour or elemental scorch marks. And if anywhere on Ravnica's not going to have running water, it's definitely the ungilded slums. Especially when the Izzet are having the slums pick themselves up and walk away. The Orzhov contract the Izzet to animate slum districts and banish them to the wastes. The Orzhov! I should have known wherever the poor were being needlessly punished, you wouldn't be far behind. So Ravnica's laws have nothing for its poor guildless then, but one group it does offer legal protection to is a cult of, I guess, anarcho-sadists who worship a giant demon from inside his lava-filled subterranean lair. The cult of Ragdos are the plane's greatest purveyors of meaningless violence. Well, the violence means something to them, but it's pretty much just, oh, the joys of pain, let's all inflict pain on each other and laugh. And maybe that sounds like fun to some of you, but believe me, they will take it too far. The Alliance of Red and Black has the guild impulsively and excitedly seeking hedonistic pleasure, and finding it in the random acts of cruelty they inflict on anyone unlucky enough to be nearby. The Rakdos don't exactly keep their demon worship to the privacy of their own clubs and hives, and often their violent revelry spills out onto the streets to involve the unsuspecting or too curious public. Rakdos cultists hanged her for sport in the township square. Her ghost now stands vigil at what has become known as the Tree of Weeping. Rakdos, the massive demon, not the guild named after him, is himself one of the plane's most powerful beings. Just as the Izzet are to Niv-Mizzet, the cult of Rakdos are a reflection of their founder, Rak Rakdos. Rakdos exemplifies his guild's brutal, hedonistic philosophy. He's a bit of a joker, baby. You know the type. And he wants to spread his chaotic ideology to the whole plane so they can all laugh together as it burns. He is pretty lazy though, and most of the time he's content watching his cultists juggle heads or just sleeping in lava for years on end. And whilst he is asleep, the cult's activities do diminish a bit, and there's less street arson. You might be wondering why the cult are even a part of Ravnican society, or how they actually contribute to it, and whilst the answer to the first of those questions is just, I'm a massive, powerful demon, appease me, the second is a bit vaguer. They might not convince you of it in the first block, but they're actually in charge of Ravnica's entertainment, so all that violent demon appeasement can be enjoyed ringside by the public. If they want. In more recent sets, the theatricality of the Rakdos has been emphasised, but this aspect was less at the forefront in the original block. It was definitely still there, but they had more of a spiky, BDSM, Mad Max, Barbarian kind of look, rather than the demonic jesters they would become. And whilst nowadays they are pointedly the purveyors of darker pleasures, they have always had some lesser discussed responsibilities. It's expressed essentially nowhere on any of the cards, and it has very little bearing on their visual identity, but the original novels make it clear that the Rakdos were the largest organisers of labour on the plane, operating the mines that fuel the world's development whilst sustaining the guild with wealth. When they aren't mining for them, the Rakdos offer these labourers to the other guilds for hire. It's not obvious if many of these labourers are loyal cultists, but 
The novels make it clear that many of them are slaves. They were mercenaries, bodyguards, and slaves. For anyone with the gold, regardless of guild. If you read about the Rakdos for long enough, this mention of labor comes up. It's just never at the forefront. Rakdos' slaves seem like this dark secret from a player perspective. And I'm not even sure if they're necessarily canon now, but in the novels you kind of get the sense that people see them as part of the day-to-day. -day. In what astute viewers may have picked up on as a running theme, it's the guildless who are the biggest victims of the cult of Rakdos. The Rakdos love to needle the edges of the guild pact because to them it's just a restraint on the fun. But its magic still prevents the majority of their mad actions from encroaching too much on the other guilds. Leaving only the largest, most vulnerable population group to be the victims of their chaos lust without any hope of reproach. When the cult's festivities take a toll on the city, the only group with no power to prevent or hold the guild's actions accountable are the guildless. Are the guildless? What did I say it like that? They win again! Prize of being a victim! But there's also a less direct, more pervasive element to the cult's relationship to the guildless. The cult is definitely one of the more lenient guilds when it comes to base membership. Because they want to spread their love of a good time to everyone, of course. Have you heard about Rakdos? Their reckless ideology of abandon could probably be quite convincing when you've got very little to lose and your life already sucks. I mean, this is how cults work in real life. They can offer work and even housing in their giant hives in the Undercity. Of course, the hives are full of violent cultists, and the work might not be pretty, or paying, or leavable. But for many Ravnikans, this is the only option. Plus, I doubt that the cult is necessarily leading with the slavery pitch when recruiting. In areas of high Rakdos influence, the line between guildless and cultist can become blurred. In more modern sets, the idea of the cult making the powerful the targets of their fun is a lot more common, and Rakdos himself's chaotic influence over the plane's power structure does help to keep some of the more authoritarian impulses of other guilds in check. Compared to a lot of the guilds, the Rakdos do view the guildless on a semi-even plane, and they might even seem like they're interested in changing the same system that so readily hurts the ungilded. But ultimately, Rakdos' idea ideology is kind of shallow and self-defeating. While there's an equality and anti-authoritarianism to their ideology that might align with the needs of the guildless, the cult definitely doesn't hold their best interests anywhere near its spiky heart, and they're more than happy to turn them into slaves or the next grisly spectacle. The very existence of the cult of Rakdos is both a danger to the ungilded, who are its victims and its slaves, and a joke at the expense of the guildless's very existence, wherein their lives and all their hard labor are worth less to the city than a cult of, I'm gonna say it again, anarcho-sadists who make their fun from ungilded suffering. I guess turning life into a joke is pretty on theme for the Rakdos. Deep under the city, in the undercity, the Golgari hang out. Green and black are the two colours that care the most about death, and death is the Golgari's whole deal. Not in a violence-worshipping, jokery, rakdos way. The Golgari embrace death as a natural part of life, and see the two paired together as an endless cycle. Their original guild symbol laid this theme on heavy, whilst also kind of making them look like janitors. Which I guess is what they are. The largest guild, in terms of numbers, the swarm is made up of various factions in a messy alliance. They're basically a bunch of dark elves, gorgons, Bugs, zombies, and other monstery type things that society would just rather be underground, please. Rulers of the Beneathiverse, they occupy the majority of available territory in the Undercity. As well as a small presence on the surface, but mostly they loom beneath the streets. Can you loom under something? In vast subterranean forests and sunken sections of Old City. They don't have the best reputation with the people of Ravnica, or seemingly even wizards in the first block. Later on, they'd pick up more of a misunderstood outcast of society vibe, but in the original block, they're shown as the scary underground druid people. To be fair to the people of Ravnica, though, the Golgari did very publicly attack the central city in conjunction with that vampire's Y2K plan, and that wasn't great for PR. On top of that are rumors of creepy things going on down there in the dark. The Swarm are responsible for the plane's waste disposal, and it's nice of them to keep the sewers running. But waste disposal also extends to previously living waste. And the Golgari like to stuff that full of vines and magic until it gets up and does their bidding. This is part of why there's so many of them. They just stuff everything that dies full of vines to make more Golgari. Cremation of the dead is not a religious ritual in Ravnica. It's a business designed to keep the Golgari from growing in numbers. But it's not uncommon for the very recently living to end up as one of these veggie zombies too. If they stray too close to the wrong part of the Undercity, or fall prey to a Golgari hunting party where the streets run thin. 
The guild's other packedly responsibility besides waste is food production. In true cyclical swarm fashion, one fuels another, and rot farmer is a very common profession inside the guild. There's a reason that old symbol looked like a reminder to recycle. They love compost. Their manipulation of this food waste cycle is so effective that the guild mass produces immense amounts of food. The most common and plentiful of which they even offer up for free to the general population. To anyone that needs it. I mean, know what you're eating is probably some sort of fungus grown out of whatever you ate last week, but it is free. And this is likely the largest impact the Golgari have on the guildless. Through this free food that's institutionalized and available to everyone, the Golgari have essentially solved world hunger. Good job. It might not be the tastiest you've ever eaten, and some people definitely scoff at its quality. And the Golgari, providers of questionable sustenance. Alright, shut up, Jace. We'll get to you in the next one. Culinary skills aside, though, the swarm keep the food flowing and the underclasses fed, and the poop and guts flowing back to them to make more food, and vines to shove into guts to make more zombies to make more food. It's a pretty perfect cycle. And few guilds tie their original responsibilities so close to their identity as the Golgari. The guild most commonly associated with death is also one of the greatest propagators of life on the plane. It's probably quite strange to live in a city that barely recognizes your rights as a person, but also won't let you go hungry, but that's what the Golgari's got for the guildless. Ravnica's commoners don't get much out of the changes the Azorius or is it enact, but the Golgari's efforts affect people at the bottom of society more than anyone else. That said, their bad rep isn't unearned, and the guild is prone to doing weird underground evil stuff. Regular internal conflicts occasionally have them following the next guild leader of the month to attack the surface like a group of angry mole people, and the Golgari aren't above releasing the odd plague or swarm of bugs, and also apparently used to have a ritual where they would steal kids from their beds and then burn them alive each harvest, and that's less than ideal. But their then new, now ex-guild leader Jared put a stop to that, so thanks Jared. But the overwhelmingly positive impact they have on the guildless's lives kind of outweighs the bad shit they do, even if some of it is particularly unsettling. The Golgari offer the guildless not only the best deal of any guild on the plane, but also a better deal than most people get out of most nations. By Jove, the Golgari. No one saw it coming, not even your parents. But you may well be taking home the one to win. The award for least predatory or negligent guild. We'll see, the night's not over. Just keep in mind, guildless friends, the next time you're feeling peckish, maybe go to one of the more public Golgari food dispensaries. Go at peak time, with lots of witnesses around, and you're almost certain not to end up in the next batch. Or worse, making it. Civilization may have crept to cover the globe, but from the corners to where it's been pushed, the natural world violently reclaims what it can. Here to help that process along as fast as possible are the Gruul clans. A long maligned guild, the Gruul were originally charged by the pact with maintaining the plains wilds and keeping civilization in check. But we can assume they were pretty bad at that job. See, the world being covered in buildings. So now the guild are barely that. Their responsibilities handed off to other guilds while they're written out of the Plains Laws. Poor old Gruul. By the time of the original set, and still today, they exist as a scattered collection of disconnected clans, almost as likely to attack each other as they are another guild. But Jiminy Jillikas, do they hate the other guilds? Well, maybe not so much the Rakdos. But over the years, the Gruul's distancing from society and their place in it has grown within them a burning resentment for the Gilded. A rage powerful enough to unite the disconnected clans, if only occasionally and briefly. Gruul clans love nothing more than to tear down civilized society and take pride in raising city blocks to the ground. Then they make camp and just hang out there, before tearing down more city to make more Gruul turf. The Rubble Belt is the most relevant of these reclaimed Gruul territories, but it's implied that across the plain, different clans operate more of these waste zones, alongside Ravnica's remaining wild beasts. They tend to get along, it's cute. Borborygmus is the closest thing they have to a guild leader, commanding the largest of the Gruul clans, the Burning Tree. His position is less concrete in the modern era, but in the old block, the massive Cyclops' strength was more than inspiring enough to command the clan and brute force smaller ones into the fold or oblivion. Like with many of the guilds, the Gruul would pick up some more nuance in their presentation later on. And to be fair to the novels, the clan shown in the second book seemed like an interesting and functional society. But card-wise, in the original block, the Gruul are purely the enemies of civilization. Gruul shamans are bent on punishing the civilized. Any act more complex than rubbing sticks together or eating with utensils is met with the stinging burn of their magic. They want to smash, and they want to smash, and they want to smash. The Gruul aren't satisfied with just smashing things. 
They continue smashing other things with the things they just smashed. Okay, we get it. But it's that absence of nuance that's their weakness in the original block. A heavier influence from British punk culture, the significance of their tattoos as maps of the districts they destroy, their rage becoming a magical uniting force, and their belief in a prophesied city-leveling boar god were all cool aspects added later. The gruel from the Guild Pact set don't evoke much beyond angry and nature. Kick stuff down, let stuff grow while we kick more stuff. Well, they are red and green, but they feel pretty one-note. It's tempting to read a connection or even allegiance with the Guildless in the Gruul's desire to tear down the structure of the Gilded City. After all, neither are protected by its laws, and many of the Gruul's ranks are made up of Guildless and ex-members of other guilds. They're all in the same boat, under the city's thumb, right? Well, the clans don't see it that way. How did Borborygmus put it? Not Gruul, then die! If you live in society, then you're civilized and you get the hammer. They may hate the more ordered guilds the most, but the Gruul don't discriminate when they're crashing through the streets or raiding travelers in the wastes. When the clans come to town, the guildless had better flee. Definitely not the hardest guild to join, to be fair, if that's your solution to the Gruul's desire to see how many rhinos can fit in your house. You want to wander out into the rubble belt and you're good at arm wrestling? Be my guest. You might even impress them enough to survive and be treated to all the guildly luxuries of sleeping under the stars. Delightful, but I'll stick to my guildless squat. Thanks. See you in the Orzov. Pay the Izzet to run my neighborhood out into the wastes. The Guild Pact, or at least the idea of it, offers Ravnica some stability, but the Azorius enforcers and arresters can't maintain the status quo alone. The true enforcers of Ravnica's order are the Boros Legion. They're the military, they're the police, they're the military police, it's the Boros. Their founder, Razia, was an angel with a big flaming sword. And she doesn't make it out of the novels alive, but she does lead the guild at the time of the first set. Then and still today, the angels of the Boros Legion are at the top of the guild's hierarchy. Supposedly, each is essentially a clone of Razia, born out of the plane's manor with an innate sense of justice. They usually hang out in a big flying fortress though, and only involve themselves in mortal affairs when dire action is required. The rest of the mostly grounded guild is made up of mostly human police and mostly minotaur soldiers, with some of each other and some other races amongst both forces. The Boros Legion is split down the middle into two semi-equal hierarchies, beneath the angels at the top of course. The police of central Ravnica City's 10 districts, these guys are called the Wojeks, and the plain standing military, the Boros Army. The Wojek's base is center fort and the army's is sun home. And it's the army's base, not the Wojek's, that operates... I realize how much Wojek sounds like Wojak now. I don't have anything to say about it. And it's the army's base, not the Wojek's, that also operates as the guild's grounded headquarters. And that might give you some idea about which half is truly in charge. Military officials have the power to order around lower ranking Wojek police, but regardless of a Wojek's rank, army grunts are under no obligation to listen to them semi-equal halves. So the world's largest military organization is also responsible for policing the central city. Do you think applying a martial structure and ideology to policing will create an approach that prioritizes civic peace and minimizes civilian casualties? Oh, I don't know, let's have a look. Justice is toothless without punishment. Righteousness cannot succeed without the suffering of the guilty. It is the call to arms, the call to fury the call to blood. Your brother's crimes are your crimes. You stood by and lent support, so you too must face judgment. Oh no, they're all violent and zealous who could have foreseen this. Their white manner desire for order and particularly justice is fueled by red into a burning passion. Brute force is how I describe a policing approach that wants the guilty and their relatives to suffer and is willing to call the military in to make sure the job is done. The novels have their own collections of examples of Wojek brutality, many of which are committed by our sometimes likeable but sometimes kind of racist protagonist, Cos. No, Cos bore no arbitrary hatred for any race or species. He did arbitrarily hate the Rakdos Guild, and occasionally, for reasons not quite as good, he drank too much Bumbat and picked a fight with anyone or anything that reminded him of a Rakdos cultist. See, Cos isn't racist. He just racially profiles and attacks people in his off hours. Cos, despite having picked a fight with a minotaur and a goblin only a couple of hours earlier, ostensibly because of their species, was not a prejudiced man. Sure, Cos, whatever helps you sleep at night. Whilst we're getting too invested in the fictional plight of fictional people, the leverage you're willing to offer the Boros will likely have some relation to how you feel about angry cops, or just cops, to be honest, in real life. 
And I'm not going to pretend it's me who's getting a raw deal, but it's why I'm having a really hard time cutting the Boros any slack here. The system that designates the guildless citizens of the city as second class at best is violently held up against them by militant and dogmatic enforcers of that system. The Boros Legion might not have a complete monopoly on violence on the plane, but they have the biggest state-sanctioned stick and they will use it to bash Ravnica into a status quo shaped hole, damn the cost. A status quo shaped hole is a circle, by the way. Like with the actions of many of the guilds in the first blog. The guildless are rarely mentioned, but given how its equivalent always plays out in reality, the idea that the Boros' blunt force approach to law enforcement wouldn't cause suffering to the city's poorest citizens is laughable at best and depressing at actual. The Selesnia Conclave are Ravnica's white and green guys. Their two colours align fairly naturally along values of life, order and harmony. One of the largest guilds, the Conclave operate on the plane as an organised spiritual faith. They preach the benefits of nature and want to see it spread as far as possible. Unlike the Gruul though, they have a particularly ordered idea of nature that doesn't involve wrecking as much stuff. They're basically a bunch of bourgeois hippies that want everywhere to be a garden. And they do make some nice gardens. I know there's a joke about festivals I can insert here, but I, I'm not cool enough to know it. I don't know anything about festivals. It's, they're like, they want everything to be like Green Man. Remember that? I don't. Their guild hall was built around a giant tree, V2 Ghazi, and deep within that tree, the Selesnian's original founder, Matt Selesnia, resides eternally. It's got like an apostrophe, but it could just be Matt Selesnia. Hi, I'm Matt, one of the parents. <laughs> anyway, supposedly Matt is a manifestation of the world's soul. The planet's soul, Ravnica's soul, but not soul of Ravnica, that's a different thing. The voice of Matt Selesnia is channeled from within the big tree by a group of dryads that act as the guild leader. These guys in the original set, and this lot later on. The Selesnia Conclave are all connected by an empathic link they call the world soul, as it emanates from within their big tree. The world soul manifests as a grand chorus, with each guild member contributing to the harmony. The song is silent, but most Selesnians can hear it with some concentration, although their ability to do so is tied to their devotion and openness to the guild's spirituality. The song's magic is incredibly powerful though, and back in Oldenblock, it was the magical backbone of the guild pact, whatever that means. Magic can be channeled through the chorus by guild members into spells and the like. The combined might, or collected empathy, of the Conclave. And so, as the Conclave have this tangible connection to each other and their Earth God, they're one of the most focused and united guilds. So how do they treat the guildless? Well, not too bad, all things considered. Nurturing and protecting community are at the core of the guild's ideals, and they're designated by the Guild Pact to duties of conservation and charity. Over time, those duties have been morphed by the guild into the singular goal of expanding nature and their community as far as possible. I guess converting the entire world to your religion is a little megalomaniacal, but at least their grand vision would have everyone chilling on the grass instead of burning in the streets. So of course the Selesnians have a very open doors recruitment policy, which is why their numbers are so great. Any guildless that want to attempt initiation are mostly limited only by their willingness to devote themselves to Selesnia. Which at face value would seem like a pretty good deal for any nearby struggling guildless folks. The Conclave have community, protection and faith on tap. We are many, yet one. We are separate in body, yet speak with a single voice. Join us in our chorus. Selesnia are also in charge of protecting Ravnica's travel and commerce links, particularly outside the central city where the Boros Wojeks don't reach. And the Selesnian Road Police's philosophy is a little bit more humanitarian than the Wojeks. They're not quite so Boros about it out on the roads, so potentially less police brutality, hooray. You could guess that if they were actively oppressing or preying on the ungilded, I would have mentioned it by now, and they are pretty clean in this regard, at least in the olden block. The Conclave did used to employ a bunch of weird, kung fu, spooky, floating ghost monks, and they generally creeped everyone out and were ultimately used against the guild to kill loads of innocent people, so that's bad. But don't worry, because this wolf that led the guild for a short time got rid of the monks, and that's good. He's called Birakazir, and Although he's a wolf with no dialogue or art, he's the best character ever and I love him. Look at this picture of his son. So, um, Selesny is not generally doing anything particularly evil, but there are some severe limits to their plant-based community ideals. Whilst it's probably the most fun one on the plane, 
The Conclave is a structured religion, and demands not only devotion from its followers, but also a level of uniformity. Individuality isn't really valued in the Guild, and whilst their ranks are definitely diverse, not every race on Ravnica is necessarily able, or particularly bothered, to connect with Selesnia's empathic world soul. You don't see any Selesnian Vidalcan or goblins. It's implied in the novels that the undead can't connect to the world soul, being the chorus of life and all. And the undead is a lot of people and... people? on Ravnica that all fall completely outside of the Selesnian's worldview. Not everyone is fit for the Conclave, and the unfit might find themselves trimmed from the garden. Ravnica, like a hedge, must be pruned, leaving only leaves of verdant uniformity. Despite their peaceful presentation, at times Selesnia has had a pretty bad reputation with the people of Ravnica, who might see them as a monolithic cult who want to stagnate and conform the entire plane, and they're not wrong. Although the gardens are nice, the Selesnian's grand vision does suffer from this critical flaw. They basically have the opposite problem to the Izzet, where the uniformity the Conclave desires can quash original ideas from their members and lead to a lack of innovation and progress. Pretty apt, then, that their magic was the primary force powering the status quo maintaining Guild Pact. They would argue that the topiary and the minefields is worth a little cultural stagnation, though. Look, they aren't so bad. They're typically a force for good on Ravnica, even if they can be a bit short-sighted. The Ungilded undoubtedly benefit from Slesnia's charity, and the Guild does genuinely care about the life and community they cultivate on Ravnica. The city could definitely use some more green spaces, and the Conclave aren't out stabbing sleeping guildless or anything, so they get a pass. If you're out on the cold streets of Ravnica, feeling naked outside the warm arms of organized religion, Selesnia's your best bet. You could do so much worse. Man, there are a lot of guilds. Ten, even. But this is the last of them. The Simic Combine are the other guild of mad sciencey types. But these guys aren't worried about portals or electric. They're the gene splicing variety. They're Ravnica's blue and green biomancers, and they love to spend all day grafting new arms or eyes on stuff, making up new types of slime, and generally just having more creature types per creature than anyone else. The guild's stated purpose has changed a lot over time, but supposedly it's to do with the preservation of all varieties of the plane's natural life. They're different from Selesnia, I promise, but it is kind of funny to me that at least three separate guilds all have protecting nature as one of their goals, and yet... Ravnica. It's like the guilds don't do what they're supposed to or something. Weird. The guild's original pact responsibilities had the Simic Combine operating as the plane's primary doctors and healers back in the day. And they don't not do that. But it's made clear in the novels that at some point before the first set, the most mad sciencey group within the Simic seized control of the guild and led them away from their Hippocratic interests and down a gooey, tentacled path. Healing people is maybe blue and green, but what's very blue and green is obsessively improving all aspects of natural life until no one has the power to stop it. Of course it will grow beyond control. It was designed to choose its own evolution. Momir Vig was the most mad sciencey of them all, and the guild's leader in the original block. Depicted here, scheming into his soup, when Vig, the Simic visionary, rose to power on the back of the coup d'etat, he... opened a bunch of free health clinics where they were most needed? But I thought I said he turned the guild away from their more doctory stuff. Under Vig, the Simic offered free healthcare to anyone who signed a waiver, and the guild developed cytoplasts. These little translucent globules worked as multi-purpose healing thingamajigs when applied to a patient, grafting to the user to offer enhancements or take the place of lost limbs. They can do weirder stuff too, like make you telepathic or become a fleshy telephone with a mouth. But the point is, for patients, the cytoplasts were pretty useful. Indispensable even. The kind of innovative healing techniques you won't find in Selesnia. Seems like a healthcare system a lot of guildless would come to rely on. Free healing and limbs in exchange for signing a teeny waiver sounds like a great deal, and I'm sure there's nothing more to it than that. Okay, yeah, there was obviously more to it than that. The cytoplasts had another function. Vig had an ulterior motive. Momacare was just a ruse. All of the cytoplasts the Simic had been liberally dishing out to the public for years broke off from their hosts and flew back to the Simic Guild Hall to all form together and become Experiment Kraj. Kraj. Kra Kraj? Made up of the genetic information of everyone the cytoplasts had left and designed by Vig to kill everyone on the plane and cleanse it for his new vision of life, Igad. Luckily, Vig got got by our old pal Koz, the, the cop from earlier. He's the protagonist of the books. 
I've done such a good job of explaining the story. It wasn't it wasn't the point, okay? That's not the point. We're talking about the guildless. Anyway, back to the Simic. So anyway, Vig and the big goo monster were both killed, and in the absence of Vig's leadership, the Simic fell into a state of disarray. So while Ravnica's people thankfully weren't cleansed from the plane, everyone who'd gotten the Simic enhancements also had them violently ripped away, crippling or killing the ex-patients en masse. You're just trying to have dinner when your new kidney leaves through the window. And with the guild essentially collapsing in Vig's wake, Ravnica's primary healthcare system was left in tatters, just as countless people needed care because of the bloody cytoblasts. People had come to rely on the service the Simic offered for years, and when Moma Vig ripped it away, along with everyone's limbs, the impact on Ravnica's struggling population must have been devastating. Law-wise, the Simic are radically different now. So different that we'll talk about that next time. But they still have the original block Simic's love of biomancy. And just like Vig's boys, they don't hoggle the tentacles for their members, and they still think it's a good idea to make wild animals more resilient. Or murderous. Which is great for some of that struggling wildlife, but not so great for the people getting pushed into the food chain. Although I guess really, they were always a part of it. The Simic Combine might not be extinction of all life evil anymore, but regardless of the set you're looking at, the Guild are a classic case for abusing their position and power to further their own ends with no regard for the people affected. Hell, Vig targeted areas that most needed care when he set up his false free clinics. For maximum efficiency, with maximum harm caused. When you're supposed to be the plane's doctors, but you steal all your patients' limbs to make a giant goo monster, you get a no from me. Oh, we made it. You feeling okay? After all those extended descriptions of fictional suffering? It looks all shiny and dandy when you're peering at the plains art, but the city's got as many dark secrets as it does bricks. Okay, probably a few more bricks. But as we can see, now that it's dirty laundries strewn everywhere, Ravnica's huge guildless population get a pretty raw deal from the whole situation. So after all that guild talk, we know the guildless have barely any power or rights, and exist as a magically oppressed underclass who fuel the city with their blood and labour, but... Who are they, exactly? Uh, you know, they hang out, they're around, they're here. They tend to stay out of the way, or get right in the way. All the things they get up to, there's this guy, and this guy, this guy... Look, the original Guildless didn't have the same level of identity that the Guilds did. There's a lack of focus across their designs that leads to them feeling undefined. Like an afterthought. The one card that has the word in its name, Govern the Guildless, looks more like it's depicting a Gruul guy being manipulated, so that's just Azorius propaganda if you ask me. The Ungilded are also lacking the Guild's organisation. Obviously. And there isn't much in the way of organised Guildless back in the old block. There's these guys, maybe, and another group that worship the Nephilim! A group of scary, weird monsters that emerge from the ground in the third book, and then all get beaten or killed and retreat underground again. So the Cult of Yor may have access to some cool magic, but it seems like they backed the wrong horse. No, the closest the Guildless get to a reliable group back in the old block is their volunteer police force, the Hazda. The Hazda shield is broad protecting both the free and the gilded. Outside of Ravnica's central city, which is most of the plane, the guilds are barely bothered to enforce the law, and the guildless are essentially forced to do it for them. The two cards the volunteer has to get in the original block paint them with quite a heroic brush, eager to step up and help even their gilded oppressors. This aura threatens the sanctity of your soul. Wrenching it free won't be easy on either of us. Ready to sacrifice herself for this Azorius Enforcer, even if he doesn't deserve her exoneration. The novels are using a different set of paints though, and there, the Hazda come off like a gang of incompetent drunks. He had the bearing of a real lawman, not one of those useless Hazda. A bunch of drunks and Wojek wannabes. They marched beside a pair of Hazda, the two sober ones she'd found at the station. The two men volunteered for the promise of free drinks. It's guild propaganda, I say. The Hazda are doing their best, all right? Booze is all they have to give their volunteers, seeing as they have to kick money up to the Boros for the privilege of doing their job for them. The evidence is on the screen. I can't bother to read it. Just pause it if you want. At least the Hazda will actually bother to investigate your murder. All of the guild's civic responsibilities don't seem to account for policing the majority of the plane's surface. Not that I think every street corner would be better with a Wojek. Look, I get it, Ravnica's a big, big place with an insane amount of people, but it's just 
Another thing on the giant pile of guildless needs that go unaddressed. Again, I'm talking about fake people, don't let my energy confuse you. The guilds think about the guilds, and everyone else is not considered. And everyone else aren't the biggest fans of this setup. You can feel the ungilded people's discontent with their rulers across their comparatively few cards. The guilds each believe its way is right, but their ways only bring blood to Ravnica's streets and tears to Ravnica's families. Your signet is no symbol of power. It marks only your need for numbers to aid you. What do you do, Guildrat, now that you face my blade alone? The flavor text for Trophy Hunter didn't make it onto the card and is hiding in an article, but it reads, You will know that I reject your guild contract when the bones of your messenger hang from my belt. This article really is one of the few places where the concept of the first block's guildless was actually addressed by Wizards of the Coast at the time. It's worth a read, but it's still lacking for any real kind of information on the group, and is focused on providing a few alternate, guildless perspectives on Ravnica. It's neat. In that article, you can also find the backstory for Helldozer, a tortured creation of the Orzhov and the Golgari. God damn it, Golgari, I spoke so highly of you. The two guilds weren't very good at controlling their poor undead demolition man, probably because they thought torture was the best way to do that. So he broke free, violently, I imagine. And now he tears through the city knowing nothing but pain, his need to destroy, and his hatred for the guilds. Which is why he untaps if he's blowing up a non-basic land. Helldozer will always make time to smash another godless shrine. Many of the block's guildless cards share this pain that reflects the guild's callousness and cruelty. And with the guildless cards design being intentionally disparate and broad, plus their all over the place aesthetics, this anti-guild sentiment kind of becomes the closest thing the guildless get to an identity in the original block. Their cards were there to flesh out the setting, to show a different and ungilded perspective on the city. But on Ravnica, the guilds cannot be escaped, and the aftermath of their actions is felt here, amongst their victims. Wizards clearly wanted to use the guildless to show the limitations of the guilds, to demonstrate the selfishness and short-sightedness of their ideologies. They could have been perfect leaders of different flavours of utopia, but that would have been really boring and not produced any conflict to make stories out of. Each guild's job is to exemplify their colour pairing's relatively extreme ideology, and wizards use the guildless as a fleshy canvas to express those ideologies against through the guild's actions, whilst also exploring the limitations and failings of those ideologies through the human cost. And as a result, each guild feels richer and more depressing, but realer. But as much as I love them, and I wrote this whole bloody thing about them, that's why the guildless are even here. It's what they're for. To be used by the guilds. That's why I set out wanting to write a thing that examined who the guildless were, and I ended up talking about the guilds for 80% of the runtime. Ravnica was built from the ground up for the guilds, and just like everything else in the setting or the block of cards, the guildless were designed to complement the real point of focus. Before Ravnica was a smashing success and Magic Player's favorite destination, they had to make sure you were interested in these cool new guilds. So they're getting the focus and everything else needs to be serving the focus. The guilds need a group of powerless peons to enact their powers upon, then that's who the guildless need to be. Like a sad homunculus thing existing just to be acted on by the guilds and defined by how the guilds treat them. Outside of that, they're not really considered. They aren't the focus, they serve it. When I think about the original guildless, which is all the time until this is done, when I think of them, I'm reminded of something Mark Rosewater, Magic's lead designer and chief of human cardboard relations, said in a 15-year-old article. Around that time, he wrote a series of articles on the five colors, defining each of them philosophically, as well as their position in the game and the color pie. After these was an article on artifacts, Magic's colorless cards that can essentially fit in any deck. And when talking about the role of artifacts in the game, Rosewater said they were designed and defined by being what the coloured cards weren't. That while artifacts can't all necessarily fit in any deck, their design is often broad and fills gaps the ideological colours can't. That above anything else, they should be tools that any budding mage with a deck of cards can find a use for. And to be honest, in the original Ravnica block, that's all the guildless get to be. A set of tools. Tools for players to fill out their decks. Tools for the guilds to utilise and exploit. Tools for wizards to emphasize their settings, other elements. The ungilded give us these brief flashes of personality and perspective that make me want so much more from and for them. But without a strong identity to call their own, 
they're almost forgotten. Drowned in a sea of strong personalities. Ultimately, as much as it pains me to say it at the end of all of this, in the original Ravnica block, the guildless are defined only by what they aren't and how they can serve. Oof, that's a pretty depressing conclusion. It'd be nice to throw the poor guildless a bone after everything the guilds put them through. Instead, I call them a bunch of tools. Doesn't feel good leaving it there. Definitely not for the tools. Hmm. But maybe there's hope. Did you know? There was a second Ravnica block. Oh, I know, I did too. I bet that block also has some guildless in it. I'd be interested to know, because change seems to be on the horizon for the old ungilded. You see, as I've mentioned a couple of times, maybe once, at least a couple of times, at least once, maybe a couple of times, at the end of the third novel, or I guess at the beginning of the, f at the end of the first book? Before the end of the novels, the guild pact that keeps the guilds in power and in check broke. No more magical guild pact, and no more magical distinction between gilded and not. The guilds are still in power, all agreeing to sign a non-magical replacement for the pact. But the status quo that we leave as we exit old Ravnica block seems set to be more unstable and volatile than ever. And who knows, maybe amongst all this tumultuous upheaval, that really sounds like a magic card, I'm sad that it's not, maybe our downtrodden subjects will be able to step out from the gilded shadows a bit next time. Maybe they'll even get some actual attention from their parents, finally. And I've heard rumours down the market. Discontent is on the rise, and a secret from before the city grew seems to be the one thing on everyone's minds and out of everyone's grasp. And stranger murmurs still. Underneath this teetering powder keg of a city, deeper even than the rot farms or the space where there is no room, something is stirring. How does it bode for the guildless? How will they fare in the new pactless Ravnica? And what terrible fates will befall them from the unseen hands of their cackling masters, Wizards of the Coast. Join me next time. Come back next time? Come back to me, please. Next time, when I'll answer at least all those questions I just asked, and probably more, when I return to talk about Ravnica 2. It won't be this long, I don't think, and I'm making it now. I'm new at- it's my first day, leave me alone. But until then, you can like this video because that's probably good, and you can subscribe to this channel, and then you won't miss part two. Oh, and you might need to ring that bell thing. Is that still relevant? Do it anyway. Thanks. Anyway, I've been Silvermere. Am I Silvermere? I still, I can't decide. I'm James. This is Silvermere, and I'll see you in part two.